We're delighted um, to introduce our seminar speaker today, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Stephen Clancy. Uh, Professor Clancy is Senior Lecturer and Director of the Slavic Language Program at Harvard University. Uh, for many years, Professor Clancy served as the President of the International Slavic Cognitive Linguistics Association. And uh, Professor Clancy's research interests include cognitive linguistics, corpus linguistics, and quantitative methods with data from Russian, Czech, and Polish. And in the past, we have had the pleasure of welcoming uh, Professor Clancy in Oxford, uh, where uh, he was a key contributor to cognitive linguistics research methods workshop and also Slavic Cognitive Linguistic Conference, um, which um, I organized and co-organized. Uh, Professor Clancy is the author of a book published with uh, John uh, Benjamins uh, in 2010, uh, The Chain of Being and Having in Slavic, and two books on Slavic case semantics uh, co-authored with Laura Yandem. Casebook for Russian, published in 2002, and Casebook for Czech, published in 2006. He is currently working on a new intermediate Russian textbook, Foundations of Russian, uh, together with uh, Veronika Yegorova, Daniel Green, and Oksana Willis. And I believe that this textbook is to be published by Routledge Publishers. And without further delay, uh, Stephen, the floor is yours, please. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar names out there too in the Zoom audience. So, all right, I'm gonna get my screen share going and we'll set off. All right, so, um, so, Title my talk, the, pro the project is called Visualizing Russian. Um, and uh, like so many things that we're doing in cognitive linguistics for the past more than a decade, um, the quantitative turn has, uh, has an effect on teaching languages as well. And this has been a long running project for me that really is in the last few years has really been coming to fruition. I'm really am glad to see that sticking with a project for a long time, uh, it's, it does pay off. So, um, so I'll show you some of the fruits of that work uh, today. Um, we also have a, uh, an article coming out uh, in a uh, Russian language journal uh, on the project. Uh, specifically uh, on the project as a itself and on the project as an opportunity for involving undergraduates in research. The, uh, that was the special theme of this particular uh, issue of the journal. And uh, Paige Lee is a Harvard senior who uh, works in computer science and Slavic languages uh, as a double concentrator. And she has just been just an amazing contributor to the project. It's been really great to have uh, an active student programmer uh, helping me out. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of things it's, I've got an idea for it. I've got data. Um, you know, I, I used to try to keep up with the coding side of things myself and do and try to be able to do everything that needed to be done. But that just got, that got away from me at some point in time. And I've really relied on Having a having a team of uh, programmers in humanities computing and uh, and being fortunate enough to find not only a, a really talented and creative student programmer but one who is already fluent in Russian as well. So um, great combination we've had the past uh, past two or three years while she's been at Harvard. So um, just some general thoughts on. Kind of how I got into this project and what I wanted to be able to do with it. Um, in general, we we have a desire to use authentic materials in language teaching, but those materials, uh, you know, whether they're written or audiovisual materials, um, they're you know valuable because they're created by and for native speakers for communicative purposes. Um, they may be raw sentences from language corpora, but the idea of the authenticity, they're not, they're not created for language learners. Um, they're not simplified. Um, they're not artificial. Uh, however, uh, 
notions like Stephen Krashen's I plus one and the notion of comprehensible input do suggest that created or adaptive materials can be useful for learners. And we've seen a move in recent years to, um, to go from using say raw corpus materials or authentic materials to uh, what we call corpus based materials that uh, you know, take, take the authenticity of the structures and constructions used in the corpora, um, but make them more manageable for language learners. Um, and, it's, and it's true that I've got some tools that do draw in raw corpus data and um, you can kind of search through them for one that's not so difficult, but, but often, especially with beginning and intermediate language students, uh, the raw corpus examples, as wonderful as they may be, are uh, just simply too difficult for them. And um, tools that have come along, uh, like Laura Yonda's smart tool, uh, University of Tromsø, uh, and uh, some of her colleagues there working on a Russian textbook as well, the Russian textbook that I've been working on with colleagues, um, we're trying to be informed by frequency and uh, corpus data but we are creating our own dialogues, for instance, our own um, uh, alongside authentic reading text, we will have a text that we've written uh, on the theme or the vocabulary of a particular chapter, things like that. So question is, you know, how can we, how can we effectively use quantitative tools and data sources that linguists are so familiar with uh, to bring that into the classroom and make uh, Make make the make life easier for students or more effective for students, as well as uh, help teachers in the creation of materials. So all the tools that I've been working on, I try to have some kind of um, I try to keep in mind those three audiences: student learners, uh, teachers, and linguistic researchers. So uh, this started out really as a, a spreadsheet where I was I was just hand typing the vocabulary that was in various textbooks uh, we were using in, uh, in the programs I was working in for teaching Russian. Um, and uh, and I, I began that back in 2009, I started, started putting together some, some vocabulary lists from the rest, from various textbooks. One of, one of my goals was just to get those lists out of the book. Um, you know, it's not, it's uh, pretty typical for a chapter to end with a vocabulary list. This one is, is sorted by part of speech. It has a few uh, extra notes about certain words, but it's pretty much just words and translations. And it's stuck there in the book and you can't do anything with it. Um, or, you know, another, another book, a typical thing, I, and a useful thing in the Slavic languages in particular is to study word formation by roots and prefixes. And this uh, idea of Slava Brazavanya, word formation, um, one of the things I've always thought about these lists, they're very, very nice and useful lists. This one has uh, the root speech um, and uh, another, another set of uh, uh, roots here with, uh, with asking or requesting, but, um, but you don't get any sense of the frequency of these words or, um, you know, just do I learn them all? Are they all equally important? Um, so one of the things that we're definitely trying to do in our materials are uh, give a sense of frequency, and that's one of the things that we can can do with the tools that I've been making. So, um, so I had that list of textbook vocabulary, and uh, I then came across Sergei Sharov's uh, frequency lists um, that were based on the Russian national corpus. Uh, he had on his website at one point in time. I don't see them there anymore, but uh, a, a a lemma frequency list and a form frequency list. And um, those were very useful uh, in moving this project along and sort of just, just kind of having the content of what the Russian word stock is. Um, but that was a, a list of 32,000 lemmas and 69,000 word forms with uh, frequency information. The lemmas also had part of speech information. Um, so the database that I put together uh, drew, on, drew on those sources as well. And that provided uh, a static lemma and form frequency information that we uh, started using in the database. And uh, that list was much more comprehensive than what Routledge published uh, as a frequency dictionary of Russian and as part of a series of frequency dictionaries uh, that Routledge put out. But there's only the top 5,000 words, which from a from an undergraduate learner perspective is pretty good. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of words to learn as an undergraduate language student. 
the next step was uh, to get to get the forms connected with the lemmas. And uh, to do that, I scraped Russian uh, version of Wiktionary, um, and, which was not complete, but it was very thorough. And with that, I was able to add uh, all the conjugated forms of verbs, um, which are quite numerous uh, in Russian, especially with participles and all of the adjectival endings that participles can have. Um, eventually, I added all that information as well. Um, and we've also started to incorporate, uh, rather than that kind of static fixed uh, frequency information we had um, from, uh, from the early 2000s, um, to, to be able to, to get more dynamic frequency information from the current version of the RNC. Uh, we've also, in some of these tools, used the uh, downloadable portion of the RNC that is fully annotated for uh, things like case and tense information. So the database that I'm using right now is currently around 33,000 words. Um, that includes, I mean, that's mostly uh, lemma entries, but we do have some phrases and multi-word expressions and some common collocations. Um, that's an area of the project that we're still working on. Um, I might say a little bit about it just now since, since I'm on it, but uh, something like Dien Raj Dienya is a, a is birthday, day of birth, and uh, that Dien can change and be in any case. The Raj Dienya is always going to be genitive of birth. Um, we're not quite able to, to deal with collocations like that with the uh, changing parts. Um, it will recognize din raj dinya in the nominative accusative form, um, but it can't recognize it, uh, everything else. And then, I mean, other also a collocation like an adjective plus a noun, damashna zadanya, homework assignment. Um, we we can't uh, we can't quite deal with the the uh, the morphological variety in those multi word expressions. But for set multi word expressions, things like patamushta is because in Russian or uh, until um, things like that, um, or or before before pitted Timcock before Positavokok after, um, we can deal with those in uh, and and we do have those built in uh, now for multi word expression. So that's that's kind of everything has been incremental, um, sort of getting things to work and then uh, and then moving on from there. The the kind of the uh, the the uh, center of uh, this was not only frequency, but uh, the idea of having some room for curated levels. And uh, so I've identified four levels that we currently use in the project. Uh, core vocabulary targets about 1500 uh, lexemes. They are the most, typically the most frequent. They're the words you can't live without. Um, they're not purely 1500 by frequency, uh, but they're also informed by communicative needs, teaching needs. Um, some of the things I bring up about this is that if you look at, say, the days of the week um, by frequency, uh, you would, if you, and you have, say, a 1500 word goal, you wouldn't learn all the days of the week, but you always teach those in a first year language class. Um, Kind of semantic sets like uh, nationality terms, so that you know students would learn uh, the the words for a France and a French person, Francia, Francuz, Francuzinka, Francuzki, pa Francuzki. Uh, but those are nowhere near <laughs> equal in frequency, um, and you wouldn't learn a whole set of words like that if you were uh, purely taking a frequency approach. So, um, so we do include things in this core level that. Uh, that aren't among the top 1500 say words. Um, another thing here is that I do group things together like adjectives with their corresponding adverb uh, as, a, as a single lexeme um, or uh, in, in the case of a Slavic language with verbal aspect, uh, the imperfective form of the verb and the perfective form of the verb uh, are learned together. So we also group those uh, in, in the same uh, block of words. So. Uh, so what is about 1,500 uh, dictionary entries uh, of a sort ends up being about 1,800 actual forms in the database. Um, and then that's our target first year, uh, first year elementary Russian goal. 
In second year Russian, we build to 2,500 lexemes, again, with those same kind of principles. It's informed by frequency, but also by pedagogical and communicative goals. And one of the things you see about that foundations level is it's, it's a sort of stubborn, uh, uh, stubborn level of vocabulary that appears across genres and text types and conversations, um, whatever, whatever kind of source you're working with. The, those are the words that just that show up across those domains um, and, it, and you can't get by without them. So it's it's again what survival Russian maybe is that top 1500 and then 2500 really you know gets you up to a very effective um, 4000 word vocabulary um, that say uh, if you if you look at a Tolstoy novel um, about 80 percent of a of a typical uh, Tolstoy novel is uh, is is those green and blue words. We are also using color. Um, I can talk more about that if people have uh, questions about it, but uh, the tools mark uh, these core words in green, the foundation words in blue. And then the next two levels are sort of the wide open sea of dealing with the language. Um, the expansions, purple words are about 15,000 words. And they really are, they're, they're, the curation kind of ends because I don't have an intention with this project to write a dictionary. I don't have an intention with this project to, ex, you know, to exhaustively cover <laughs> yeah, the entire language. So um, the, the idea of curation mostly ends at this point, um, and we rely solely on, on lemma frequency. But the next most frequent 15,000 words are purple. Um, and then what I call specializations, the orange word is about another 12. 12,000 words in our database. Um, I mentioned that the foundation, you know, the, 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 the core is, is kind of the Zipfian drop off. You, you sort of see this characteristic of these words. Foundation of this kind of stubborn around 20% you see and expansions, um, it's kind of like, it's, it's as you keep living and keep interacting with the language, you just keep learning more words as life goes on. And it really has that kind of cat, uh, characteristic. It's just, the words you just, if you keep interacting with the language, you keep learning more and more words. And specializations are just pretty reliably rare words. They're, they're low frequency words. They may be uh, specialty vocabulary for a particular field or something, but they, they're also just very low frequency words. And then those are the four word, uh, levels that emerge directly from the database, but words that aren't analyzed make an interesting fifth level. And uh, if you're analyzing a novel, uh, or a, a journalistic text, uh, these are going to be your proper nouns. It's your, your people, your places. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, not everything is in that 33,000 word uh, dictionary, but it's pretty thorough. Uh, but sometimes we're missing things like neologisms or slang, recent borrowings, um, or sometimes either substandard alternative spellings, things like that don't show up. So, uh, our database has these lexeme entries. We have full uh, declension and, and uh, conjugation information. Um, and we have about 300 fields for each one of these entries. And how do you make that huge uh, mass of quantitative information available, useful, and relevant for this audience, again, of students, teachers, and researchers? So um, I think I'm going to skip kind of the through the early uh, early inspirations I had in the project, but uh, just things that made uh, websites more interactive, um, different kinds of uh, polyglot entre entrepreneur projects that you can find on YouTube and on the internet. A um, lo lot of different interesting things going on to help language learners um, that uh, have kind of informed some of the work that I, uh, some of the background work I did thinking about what tools we needed and what I wanted to do with this project. And here's where we are today. We've got a suite of tools. Um, this is all available um, at our website, which is uh, visualizingrussian.fas.harvard.edu. FAS is Faculty of Arts and Sciences. That gets put in there everywhere. Um, but bas basically, it's Visualizing Russian at Harvard. And uh, I'll be walking through some of these tools. The, ma the main tool was our visible vocabulary tool, which is a text parser. Um, and I'll really just get into to showing these things. So as we start to think about this, and if, when we have time for questions, if anybody wants to see, I'd be happy to do kind of 
a, a live demo of some of this if I if you don't get a good feel for it uh, in the course of my talk. Um, but so we might want to analyze text for relative difficulty with regard to vocabulary content. Uh, we might want to create frequency lists uh, or make a dictionary based on the text we want to read with students in a course. Um, we we may want to we may want to see the relative frequency for the various forms of a verb or or a or a noun. Um, we may want to compare uh, target vocabulary we are interested in teaching to students to what kind of coverage that has in a text. Um, we uh, also can uh, look at the relative frequency of near synonyms. That could be things like I mentioned, like the days of the week or musical instruments or um, various kinds of semantic groups like that. Um, I also have developed some tools that look at uh, case governance and prepositions for verbs. Um, also the, the how cases are used with a particular noun and uh, say, you know, something like, uh, like pencil, um, we expect that to be a tool, it's an instrument. So um, the idea that it's heavily used with the instrumental is not, uh, is not unexpected. So you can see, or that a, a, a restaurant is a location. So uh, there are certain cases that you see that uh, different words have different profiles with the cases they're typically used with. So we have a tool that does that. Um, we do this kind of uh, word formation where we can look at prefixes, roots, and suffixes. We're starting to develop some tools that that work on um, on those kind of things too. So, and uh, kind of the we've just sort of dipped our toe in the water of dealing with um, large scale uh, vector spaces where you can compare, say, a word with its near uh, its its nearest neighbors in a vector space. Um, I do I do have some tools that will do that but it's really just we're just sort of getting into that all right so um so the visible vocabulary text parser ideas you can any electronic text you've got you can cut and paste that into the tool you get an analysis back that gives you a sense of the difficulty as uh understood in terms of the word level contents um and you see those those uh four levels of vocabulary and uh you also can, uh, you, you could use the, the website as a reader if you wanna read right there on the site or you can cut and paste into Word or uh, other, other programs and preserve that uh, color analysis. And it really, it really works very well. Um, you, can, you can do quite a bit of text at one time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over and, uh, and show the tool in action. And I'm gonna I'm gonna grab about uh, we do have limits set on the number of words you can do, but uh, but it's pretty it's pretty big and generous in what we do. All right, so I'm gonna go over to these tools and all right, so uh, so here's our website visualizingrussian.fas.harvard.edu and uh, the. The main tool here for analyzing text is the visible vocabulary tool. And I'm gonna paste in quite a bit of text. So this is about half of uh, Dostoevsky's Biesi or the demons or the possessed. And it is gonna take a moment to do this, but this is analyzing quite a lot of text. Um, we'll see what pops out of that in a minute. I do have a cooking up, well, it's already done. So that was 85,000 words. Um, and one of the things we can see, D Dostoevsky novels tend to be uh, more difficult in this regard than Tolstoy does. But um, our level one most frequent vocabulary comprised 67% of this text. Um, if we had, you know, we're dealing with kind of intermediate speakers, of they can understand that over 75% of this novel is words they should know. Um, the idea here too is if, you know, if you are dealing with authentic texts, uh, students at various levels can focus on the things they need to focus on. So um, if they are first and second year Russian students or even third year Russian students, they need to make sure they know their green words. <laughs> they need to make sure that they are really solidly learning their blue words. And then anything else is for the future. So it helps to be able to put aside some of, uh, some of the vocabulary or to get a sense of um, 
you know, where, where you are as a language learner and where you want to go and what, and what's going to be most valuable to you uh, at the stage you're at, at that, at that point in time. Um, I teach another class typically for uh, grad students, uh, master's students uh, who are working with mostly uh, social science texts and press and academic articles and things like that, history. And uh, a lot of the, they, they, again, should already know their green and blue words. The uh, purple and orange words that turn up in their articles tend to be the professional jargon uh, and the domain specific uh, economics, military, national security, um, diplomatic kind of vocabulary that they need. So it's also the, a way of focusing on what those uh, what those domain specific words are. Um, also for, for a student working without a teacher, uh, sometimes these the purple and orange words are indicators of the, either words that say like a 19th century novel are um, are archaic words or um, you know words that don't have don't have the same frequency in the modern language that they don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, all right, so this is not meant to be a dictionary, but uh, but you can click on words and get information. So we're trying to plug in uh, information from that huge database in a way that makes things more accessible. So uh, igrat is the verb to play. Um, we do have uh, information about its aspectual usage in that. So igrat sigrat is the imperfected perfected pair. And it's a play is an activity verb. So we expect it to have a really strong uh, imperfective profile. And it does. It's 83% of the time it's we're using the imperfective verb. Um, I do have translations for green and blue words, but that drops off as soon as you as soon as you get out of the you know top top four thousand words or so. So, um, so if you if you do if you do click on uh, words, you do get some information about it. Part of speech, you always get part of speech information. Um, if you if you click on a noun, you get stress pattern information. Polygenia has fixed stem stress. Um, yeah, for uh, Chelyviek, we get that it's paired with nudi um, for person and people, uh, and so you do get you do get some information about uh, things like that. So we we've we've tried to start pu pulling in some of this information as we go along. If you click on another, uh, see if there's any other interesting verbs, uh, but. Anyway, that's uh, and you can you can just cut and paste this uh, out into another uh, into a uh, into a word processor. Well, I'll go ahead and show you the uh, the mini story creator. Um, so I named this the mini story creator because um, thinking about how teachers or students might use it, uh, and the idea that you might have a say a set of target vocabulary. And then you either, as a teacher, want to write something, a, di a dialogue, a text uh, using that vocabulary, or you might give that to students as an assignment to write something using the vocabulary. And the tool allows you to compare uh, how well you've used that target vocabulary in your particular text. Um, but the tool is also uh, effective for creating frequency lists. And so, here, I mentioned this class I teach where students mostly are reading social science texts. Uh, this was, um, I put the entire corpus we ended up reading. Uh, students choose about a 1500 word article to read each week. And we read about 6,000 words a week in that class. Um, and we do use these tools. Uh, but looking at what we read over the course of an entire semester, uh, which was 8,600 lemmas uh, that appeared in those texts. And um, also comparing that to a typical, this was a one week uh, target vocabulary list, which has some things like representatives and negotiations and cooperation, agreement, uh, relationships, delegations, treaties, stuff like that. So how, you know, how well did that vocabulary list, was it represented in the text that they ended up reading? And that particular, Weeks list are shown here. Anything with a check mark means it occurred in the in the text, and 
Uh, and then you get into the thing. And it's a lot of these things that aren't in there, it's actually pretty good coverage, are just some were some grammatical notes that aren't even words. And um, and then and then a few words that didn't didn't happen to make it into those texts. But um, but when I look at our vocabulary list, they're pretty good vocabulary lists. Um, this also can be looked at uh, in different ways. So you can, um, if you just look at at frequency, um, you know, in at this for this purpose, the green words are not going to be very interesting. They're the most frequent words. They're doing a lot of grammatical functions. Um, but if we if we do look by um, by level, uh, we can start to see if we go down. I'm just going to go down to the purple words. If we're advanced students, what do we want to start learning? Got to get my Zoom stuff out of the way. There we go. And this is by reverse frequency. So I'll start at the bottom of that list. So again, this is probably about a 60,000 word uh, text that, that covered the whole semester. But so um, some more advanced words that you would want to focus on uh, as a student in this class, vayenli, uh, which is military, yadrni, um, nuclear, ekonomicheski, economic, um, protest, uh, minister of government, uh, actions, um, sources, threats, uh, announcements, uh, batteries, <laughs> I'll kind of see all kinds of things came up. Um, actually, it's, so we, we rely on frequency in, uh, in these tools and we haven't done anything really technical with disambiguating forms. Um, so when you do have words that overlap and you have homonyms, um, it does happen. So uh, obviously Vladimir Putin is in a lot of these texts and uh, his name overlaps with Putina, which is the word for a fishing season. So uh, anytime Putin is in there, he gets lumped in with Putina, uh, even though that's not the right word. But um, we've been the way we've been disambiguating things is relying solely on frequency. So if there are if there are words that overlap, we take the most frequent, we assume the most frequent form, uh, and that works pretty well, and it works pretty well for our purposes. But um, but there are some issues like that that you would have to go through and and disambiguate or correct, um, but, but they're fairly few. Uh, we're actually pretty fortunate. Russian is a language that doesn't have a lot of homo homo uh, homonymy. So um, anyway, so you get a sense of uh, what the most important words are. You can get a sense of how well things correspond to your, uh, to your vocabulary lists uh, and things like that, or you know, target vocabulary, or you can simply get a list of words by frequency and, um, Maybe even more importantly, uh, you can get a sense of uh, in a in a highly inflected language, uh, what are the most important forms of a particular word? And um, you know, I mean, an adjective like "vayenli," uh, military was or military person, uh, that's got pretty good coverage of, of all possible vocab. You know, case forms you're seeing that or "vlast authority" has pretty good representation in in this uh, sample of text. But uh, but certain words are going to um, already start to show uh, a, a, a stronger association with certain uh, cases. And so this is something you can get out of this. And this is also something that uh, researchers might be interested in. All right. And I'd be, uh, you know, happy to show any uh, demonstrations of things that you might want to see uh, later on. So um, we 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 did make all this work really with a brute force database. <laughs> um, all the morphological forms are there. Um, if we find that something is uh, sometimes a word that's left in black and unanalyzed is something that's simply maybe the lemma is in the database, but not the forms. And so we we can go in and add them manually if it's an important enough word. Um, we've dealt with things incrementally as they've come up, like being able to deal with uh, hyphenated forms, um, with, uh, some very frequent grammatical functions like tota is someone, stonyebut, something, anything. Um, but we generally deal with hyphenated words in as an analysis of their separate parts. So Fransuzhenka Guvernantka, which is in the beginning of uh, Anna Karenina, 
uh, the French governess um, we deal with as a French woman and a governess, and uh, they they have different frequency. Um, so we see those parts. Um, I mentioned earlier that we we have started to deal with uh, multi word expressions, and um, and so uh, those those fixed word multi word expressions. Uh, fixed forms do uh, turn up as a single unit in uh, the text parser now. All right, I talked about disambiguation. Um, and yeah, and we, we've added things like the, the stress information and the aspect gauge. Um, so we, you know, and you, you see certain verbs have definite uh, strong tendencies toward one or the other aspect or they're well balanced. Um, the mini story creator, I think I said everything I wanted to say about it. Um, all right, and then uh, the quick lemma tool. Uh, so this is, you could put in a single word and you can automatically generate the forms from uh, the database. Uh, you, can you can look at the frequency of uh, say certain case forms for a noun or adjective uh, of certain, uh, certain verb characteristics for the verbs. Or you can put in um, you can put in just any kind of uh, lexical set you might want. I've since I've mentioned the uh, the days of the week uh, multiple times. Maybe I'll go ahead and and pop those in just so you see the point. Um, so quick lemma tool. We can put these in. We can get the frequencies. Uh, <laughs> These are all green words because we've made them all green words, but you can see that uh, Tuesday is the least frequent. And if you were learning, you know, it'd be a long time before you knew 8,800 words in Russian uh, and you wouldn't know Thursday or Tuesday um, until you'd gotten to those points if you were purely informed by frequency. Um, this tool uh, also pulls in uh, the Google Ngram viewer and which uh, sometimes has slightly different outcomes. So Tuesday is not the uh, least frequent. Um, Saturday and Friday are actually showing up. Um, we also, this is the drawing on those static frequencies, but we can also do um, more up-to-date uh, frequencies from the Russian National Corpus, um, where we can, we can see how many occurrences of these words are in the Russian National Corpus. Um, we still have Thursday and Tuesday down at the end. Um, and let's see another one. Uh, you know, some, sometimes some of these are interesting for different reasons. So <laughs> different words for pants. Um, and this is, I think where, you know, like the Google Ingram viewer is a little more in, like, you know, you can see that, that jeans, jeans, say this green line, uh, something happened in the sixties and seventies that jeans started being talked about in Russia. Um, and Bruki and Stanley uh, have sort of been competing for a long time. Uh, and as far as their, uh, their frequency, um, you know, we can, we can look at their, their lemma rank as well. We can compare that to uh, the Russian national corpus. I don't know what this word gin size, but that's, that's, it will link up to other, other, other things um, as well. But uh, that's just being, it's being thorough when it does that. So. So the quick lemma tool can uh, can be used for this kind of domain comparison, or it can be used for form comparison for a particular word. So um, if you put in if you put in something like the verb to read, you can generate right away all the forms for that. It's too many forms to look at in the Google Ingram viewer. When you you can see this is a this is a single verb, and this is all the forms that that verb has. <laughs> uh, that I mean, it, it's blown out of proportion by the participles, which have all adjectival forms, but um, but it's still an amazing number. Ba basically, about seventy-two forms for any particular verb uh, as an aspectual pair, plus everything the participles are doing. We have to have all those forms in our database uh, because those participles can be in any form when we have a text we're analyzing. Um, when I added the participles, it made a world of difference of, of how thorough the tool covered uh, the text we were analyzing. It was a really big step forward. All right. So, um, so we can look at lexical sets with uh, that quick lemma tool. Um, we can, you can explore near synonyms. Um, you can do aspectual comparisons. 
uh, and or you can look at you know particular domains like expressions of the emotion of fear, things like that. The noun case distribution tool um, creates a spider chart of uh, what's what's going on with the case of a particular uh, noun. So let's uh, let's go take a peek at this. This is based on um, it. We have not had any success with uh, getting this to work on a raw corpus because there's uh, so much syncretism in the Russian case system that the morphological overlaps um, just you don't you don't get a, a very reliable uh, image of what kind of the case profile of a noun is. Um, we also see that uh, in the in the much smaller uh, grammatically uh, annotated corpus section of the Russian national corpus, uh, we don't always have very many examples uh, for particular nouns. So it's it's of limited use at the moment, but it's an interesting tool all the same. And go back to the website. And this is the case distribution tool. And so I mentioned Karandash, so we can get a, ch a chart and a, we can get a detailed chart and a basic chart. So um, what we're seeing is uh, uh, the blue is the uh, plural and the yellow is the singular. Uh, unfortunately, there's only 14 instances of this word, but even with that, we can see that pencils are frequently nominative, they're accusative direct objects, and they're very strongly uh, used as in, you know instruments, but they're not things that receive in the dative. They're not locations. Um, they're not uh, mentioned in possessive constructions in the genitive. So, um, but you know this noun didn't really have a lot of uh, a lot of representation in the limited corpus we're dealing with. Uh, restaurant uh, restaurant is in there sixty nine times. That's a little better, and we really see that restaurant is strongly a location. You see that it's much more used about a particular restaurant in the singular rather than restaurants in the plural. Um, but we start to see a different kind of case profile. This is one of the tools I think has potential, um, but there's only so much we can do with it uh, at the moment. Um, let's see, something like uh, is attitude or relationship. And this one has a, a quite a different profile um, in meaning. Atnashenya is like attitude in the singular and it's relationship or relations in the plural. So one, we start to see um, a little more balance between the use of the singular and the plural. And, um, and you also, also start to see some case differences. So, um, so this one is you know, something I think has, has potential, but we need, um, we need more annotated data to really work with it. And I, haven't yet got a sense of you know how much representation do you need for a, a noun in a corpus before you have a reliable kind of case profile in uh, in terms of these spider chart images. We do have a, a version of this that we've tried out for verbs, but but for that same reason that verbs might have easily seventy two forms uh, it, or thirty six if we're just dealing with one aspect, um, and all the categories of tense and person, um, you get a very messy chart. So we've started experimenting with ways of, of kind of fusing, like it, it, fusing person, fusing tense, um, but, uh, but it's really still work in progress. All right. Um, and then this would go along with an idea of, uh, and Laura Yonda's written about this in recent years, uh, that it's important to teach the most the most prominent forms of a of a word, especially in a highly inflected language. Um, so something like the verb to like, um, it's something is pleasing to me. Uh, used with the dative, we mostly use that in the third person, singular and plural. So the you know if you look at the profile of that verb, it's much more about those particular forms. Um, and and that you know that's another thing too that that information those form frequencies are in the database. So what we're trying to do is is build tools that that reach into that into all that data and uh, pull together words that have similarities. Um, the word formation tool 
is uh, is really to take that idea of pulling apart a word by its roots and prefixes and suffixes and be able to um, to look at uh, either words that are related by root, words that are related by prefix, words that are related by suffix. Um, this uses uh, kind of a, a cloud of, uh, of little spheres that uh, circulate around um, a particular item. And it, it does draw on, um, you know, some, something we've, we've done in textbooks for a long time, this kind of work with, with roots to, uh, to make a tool, let's see here, I'll show this. So you, you get kind of a, a word group cloud. This is with the, um, the verb, the, the root for, uh, for placing something, laying something. Um, and we, we again, can, we can get a sense of uh, the frequency by how close items are to the, to the center root. Um, and you can, you can vary the, uh, both the size of the, of the display. And you could also say, I'm not interested in the, the least uh, frequent forms. I wanna focus on these forms. And, and we do, since we do have dictionary information, you do get, translations generally for these green and blue forms. So, <clears throat> so we don't have everything represented, but you can look at um, words by, by root and uh, at, at present, so. That one doesn't have anything interesting. Well, my on the fly, I'm not seeing any really things that I want to jump out of. Uh, anyway, if anybody has anything they want to look at, we could look at it later. All right. And I think I may uh, just stop and let you ask questions. Um, beyond here, we get into the, into the, uh, uh, dabbling with the vector spaces and coming up with how um, how words are related uh, in those in those large corpora that have been turned into vector spaces. But I think that's really the main coverage of the tools, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you've got.